In the last two studies, we've been taking a look at the parousia of Jesus Christ. We're going to continue uh, to look at that uh, Greek term parousia, which is generally translated as coming in the King James Version, but in the original Greek, literally means presence. Nowhere does parousia mean coming or coming again. The parousia of Jesus Christ, the presence of the Son of God, is a past, present, and future reality. His parousia is the ongoing, progressive unfolding of himself. The parousia is the enveloping presence of Christ, and to stand before the Son of Man is to awake to the wonder and glory and majesty and power of his presence. It is the fullness of all that one can conceive of as being the reality of his promise in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where he says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And again in Matthew 28:20, 20, he says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. The parousia is the presence of his glory and the glory of his presence. The doctrines and creeds of most churches of our day have developed around and focused upon six events in the life of the Christ. These are known as the Incarnation, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection, the Ascension, Pentecost, and the Second Coming of Christ. But because the fourth of these, the Ascension, has been so falsely interpreted and distorted, the church world has come to the wrong conception of the last two, Pentecost and the return of Christ. If one did not search the scriptures but listened only to the church preaching hymns and doctrines, he would surely gather the idea that the Christ has gone somewhere. No one seems to know where he is, but he is in some far off heaven somewhere literally and permanently seated upon a majestic throne. At any rate, the church world is sure that he has left the planet Earth because they believe he, the disciples saw him go. So the vast majority of Christians are convinced and firmly believe the New Testament affirms that Christ is no longer on Earth. When Jesus was holding communion with his beloved disciples in those heaven-blessed days following his resurrection, on one occasion when he appeared in the midst, we read in Matthew 28:17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Are they still doubting? This passage does not mean that. Let me briefly give you the scene, not so much from the English translation, but from the finer reading of the Greek in which Matthew wrote the record. It was like this. The eleven were gathered at the appointed place, but Jesus had not come. He was not late, he was never late. But according to their reckoning, he was late, and he had not come. Peter goes down to the brow of the hill, where he can get a view of the path winding up the hillside, to see if he is coming, but there is no sign of him. Another disciple goes down to see if he is coming, and returns shaking his head. The master has not arrived. Is he really coming? And suddenly, as before, he is there. He is there not immediately in their midst, but just a little way from them. He is suddenly there, and no one had seen him arrive. Of course, as before, it is probable that he had been there all the time, and suddenly he made himself visible to them, and they all saw him. As they looked upon him suddenly appearing yonder before them, the majesty of his person compelled them to worship. It is the prostrate word for worship, the word which means that they were flat on their faces before him. And in the very act of worshiping, some doubted. Wavering worshipers. It is tragically possible still to worship Christ, and yet in the very act of worshiping him, to waver. Now this word doubted is an unusual word. It only occurs twice in the New Testament, and both times are in Matthew. When Peter walked on the water and was saved by Jesus, Jesus said unto him in Matthew 14 and 31, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? It is the same word, 
and it is only on these two occasions, then and there, that this word is used in the New Testament. It means literally to stand in two ways at once. Let's take a look at Peter walking on the water. One minute he was looking at his Lord and walking by faith. The next minute he was looking at the waves and walking in fear. Then again looking at the Lord and receiving strength. But immediately a big wave makes him lower his victorious gaze and he is once more frightened and floundering. Wavering. Standing in two ways at once. Vacillating back and forth between the spirit and the flesh. One moment full of faith, the next moment full of fear. A very unsatisfactory way of walking and living. As stated by James in James chapter 1 verse 5 through 6, He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Now on this specific occasion, as they looked at him standing there suddenly before them, they were compelled to worship. So glorious was he, so commandingly majestic they had to worship. As some of them lifted their gaze from their prostration on the ground, they looked into his eyes, and they saw something that was so challenging there that they knew he had big things for them. They knew he was calling them to something great. And as they looked at him, worshipping him, they shrank, some of them, from what they knew he was going to give to them and demand of them. They wavered. They were wavering worshippers. Do you not remember some great experience, some glorious meeting, or some wonderful manifestation of God's presence, some mighty move of His Spirit, some awesome unveiling of His glory when the Lord Christ was so exalted before you in the power of the Holy Spirit that you were worshipping Him, that there was nothing else to do, you had to worship Him? Did you waver as you worshipped? In the face of his glory, at the majesty of his presence, you caught an enthralling glimpse of the glory set before you, the glory of the sonship to God, the holy expectancy of being made like him, conformed to his image, the awesome wonder of sharing his mind and his wisdom, his authority and his power, the calling to be a joint heir and co-ruler with the Christ in the marvelous work of redemption and restitution to restore the creation into God again. This high and holy calling, known only by the revelation of the Holy Spirit of truth, is a jewel and a prize to be greatly cherished by God's elect. But did you waver as you worshipped? Is it not true that in the very face of the efficacy of the moment of divine illumination and quickening, we are at once distraught by the haunting voice of the carnal mind pressing its demands upon us? You will never make it to perfection. Our inherent weaknesses and persistent faults, our unconquered carnality and obvious mortality present themselves before us, magnified like weird mocking monsters, dancing hideously in the twilight, taunting, jeering, scorning, sneering, and condemning. Just who do you think you are? A son of God indeed. You will never be a son of God. You wretched little pretender. You can't make it. Such a high and holy calling is forever beyond your grasp. You will never be an overcomer. You claim too much. It's not for real. Is this not the voice of the carnal mind speaking to you? So it's no wonder they wavered. Look what he had to say to them. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore go ye and disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, literally, all the days, even to the consummation of the age. Now take notice of the four alls. All power, all nations, all things, and all the days, even to the consummation of the age. Consider his power. He said, all power is given unto me. In the Greek, it's all authority, exosia, not dunamis. So he's saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
That is the position the Ascended Lord occupies today. All authority in heaven and on earth are in his hands. Now consider his plans, where he said, Go ye therefore, and disciple all nations. And consider his principles, where he said, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now consider his presence, where he said, And lo, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion, to the very close and consummation of the age. All the days, Sundays and Mondays, all the days, days of sunshine and blessing and glory, days of thunder clouds and turmoil and trial, all the days, days when everything goes right and days when everything goes wrong, days when you have the victory and days when you suffer defeat, all the days I am with you, he said. Throughout the march of the centuries, an innumerable multitude of men and women have claimed these beautiful words as the unfailing promise of our Lord. But that is not a promise. He did not say, I will be with you all the days. It is better far than a promise. It is a fact. I am with you always. He made no conditions. He didn't say, if you do this, that, or the other, I'll be with you but stating as an accomplished, perpetual, unchanging fact the complete assurance of a constant and age-lasting presence of the Christ with us. How much plainer could any statement be? Yet most preachers today confidently affirm that he is gone. Christ is in heaven, they say. But his spirit is with us here as though his spirit was somewhat or somehow not he himself. Who is the Lord anyway? 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. In Mark 16.20, Mark tells us that they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. After he ascended, he was right there with them still. When Jesus uttered his wonderful proclamation, and lo, I am with you always, that proclamation forever established that in truth, Christ never would depart. There's a great difference between ascending and departing. In John 20:17, Jesus said, I ascend unto my Father and your Father. But never once did he say that he would depart from them. Just as he said in Hebrew 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What the church today regards as the departure of Jesus was never regarded as such by his disciples. Instead, it meant to them a condition of power because he told them that he must go away that the Comforter might come. We find this in John 16, verse 7 and in John 14, verse 17. None of the gospel writers felt that the taking up involved any departure of the Christ. It never meant an end of his presence to any of them. It really meant a far greater realization of his presence than they had ever experienced. Their statements that he continued to work with them, that he said he would be with them to the end of the age, and their fullness of joy all testified to the fact that they believed he was still with them, and had not gone away anywhere. Note the statement in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the last chapter of Luke's Gospel, and the first chapters of its sequel, which is called the Acts of the Apostles, the pen of inspiration has faithfully recorded the facts surrounding the ascension of our Lord, and his coming to us as the Spirit. You can find this in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 52. Jesus led his faithful little band of followers out of Jerusalem as far as the village of Bethany. And while speaking to them, he stretched out his hands in blessing upon them. As he blesses, his feet lift from the grass, and still blessing them, he rises upwards. 
They follow him with their gaze until a cloud intervenes and receives him out of their sight. Only out of their sight. Not out of their company. Only his bodily presence was denied to them. Remember what he said, Lo, I am with you always. In a sense, he didn't really go away. He only went out of sight. And in ten days' time, he was to come to them in a closer way than ever by his indwelling spirit. It says in Acts 1.9, And a cloud received him out of their sight. The phrase received him out of is one word in the Greek meaning to take under. It signifies to take up a placing one's self underneath, similar to a hiker carrying a backpack, or as a waiter holds a tray. The Weymouth translation puts it this way, the cloud closing beneath him hid him from their sight. This was not a cloud, not a rain cloud in which lightning flashes. This was a cloud of the glory of God, the Shekinah, same thing described in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4 where it says a great cloud and brightness. A cloud is the best known eastern symbol for the radiance which hides, as Job said in 26.9, the face of his throne. The Hebrew term translated cloud in Ezekiel is anoam, a word that is occasionally used of the nimbus or thunder cloud but which is repeatedly used for the glory cloud of Jehovah. The first appearance of this Hebrew word as the word cloud is as a technical term for the Shekinah is found in Exodus 13:21, where it reads, And the Lord went before the Israelites by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way. It was this cloud which Ezekiel saw while he was with the exiles in Babylon. The glory cloud is the chariot of Jehovah. Composed of myriads of celestial beings, the spirits of just men made perfect, the armies which are in heaven, the heavenly hosts of the spiritual world. As stated in Isaiah 19.1, Behold, declares the prophet, the Lord rideth upon the cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of the cloud. Just as the cloud covered the mount at the giving of the law in Exodus chapter 24 verses 15 through 18, it also covered the tabernacle when it was completed. In Exodus 40 verses 34 through 35 it says, And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Many years later, Solomon finished the work on the temple, and in 1 Kings 8, verses 10 through 11, it says the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. We need to note that the cloud and the glory are equated as synonymous. For the cloud filled the house and the glory filled the house are stated in parallel fashion. This is the cloud of his glory into which the triumphant saints of God are to be quote unquote caught up. As stated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 through 17. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. There's not a definite article in the Greek text before the word clouds to make it the clouds, which would thus identify them as the clouds of the lower atmosphere surrounding our earth. Where the identifying article is missing, it speaks of quality or is used as a descriptive term. The Greek word for cloud is often used of a large body of individuals in the Greek classics. And this is the same way it's used in Hebrews 12.1 where it's speaking of the great cloud of witnesses which surround us. Therefore our quote-unquote catching up is being brought into that higher spiritual sphere where we become one with that whole great cloud of witnesses. 
or as Hebrews chapter 12, 23 says, the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This is a union of forces. When those of our generation upon the earth, and all those overcoming saints of all former ages who have gone on before us, are joined together, becoming an indestructible force in the full, total, and complete manifestation of His majesty, power, and glory at the manifestation of the sons of God. The resident within the shimmering cloud of glory is just the Lord Himself, the source of the dazzling light, because it is Him who causes the celestial host to shine forth, thus forming the quote-unquote cloud and manifesting His glory thereby. He will be revealed to us. He'll complete all his work and purposes in us. And then he'll lift us up into higher realms of the Spirit, completing the union with the whole body of the firstborn. Then will he be revealed in us in fullness, as Paul explained in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty messengers, in flaming fire, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. Now notice what Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And in Jude 14 it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Or as the literal translation says, Lo, the Lord comes in holy myriads of himself. If you'll just take a few minutes to meditate upon these two verses, you will begin to realize that the Lord coming with clouds and the Lord coming with saints is not two separate events, but the same thing. The cloud that received Jesus out of the sight on the day of his ascension was the same cloud which revealed the majestic person of Jehovah on Mount Sinai and in the tabernacle and temple of old and the very same cloud with which he comes again and to which his elect is gloriously caught up. You see, at his ascension, it was the cloud of celestial spirits swooping down from realms of glory to bear him up in triumph to the sphere of authority, power, and blessing which should thenceforth flow forth as a mighty river of life through the channel of his body upon earth. As the Greek text states, they came and they wrapped him around, some of them underneath him, and into their presence he passed, and the eyes on earth beheld him no longer. From the eternal and omnipresent realm of the Spirit, he occupies the omnipotence of the throne of the universe. From the throne he gives the Holy Spirit of his presence to all who believe. It is my hope that the eyes of your understanding, you can see that beyond the veil of the flesh is the realm of God, the realm of the Spirit, and it is there that Christ of God dwells, and it is there he must be touched, seen, known, and experienced. He didn't leave us, for he promised he never would. His disappearance from the sight of men was not a lessening of his presence with us in any way. Instead, it was an intensification of that presence. Jesus was transferring that presence from one body to many bodies. He was expanding and enlarging his power and influence and character among men. That expansion and enlargement has continued throughout the centuries. And the body of Christ has continued to grow and develop in preparation for the full and total and complete manifestation of his life when every elect son of God has come forth finally from Father's hand full grown in the mind, nature, will, power, and dominion of Almighty God. This testimony joins in harmonious accord with that of the beloved disciple John when he declared in 1 John 5:20. We know that the Son of God is come. He is here now in the world in us. And it will have to be through us that the world will come to the knowledge and experience of this present Christ. 
the enveloping and overwhelming of his presence. This is the parousia of Jesus Christ. Now let's take a look at a couple of other scriptures that touch on the parousia of our Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming or parousia or presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. This scripture has been used a lot to substantiate the rapture teaching by assuming that the parousia of the Lord was a future event and likewise that our gathering together unto him was a future event. Please notice that the phrase by the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and the phrase by our gathering together unto him references to the very present reality which was first spoken of by the Lord himself when he said in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. There you have the two ingredients, the presence of the Lord and the gathering together unto him. The Concordant New Testament translates this passage as, now we are asking you, brethren, for the sake of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to him. And Rotherham's translation reads, But we request you, brethren, in behalf of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. The Diaglot makes a still clearer translation where it renders it, we entreat you, brethren, concerning the presence of the Lord of us, Jesus anointed, and of us assembling to him, which portrays the Lord as then and there present, and their gathering or assembling to him to be then and there. In other words, the apostle was beseeching the saints at Thessalonica that as they were gathered together or assembled unto the Lord in his presence, they should not be shaken in mind or be troubled by the fact that the day of the Lord they waited for was not to immediately break in its fullness of glory unto them. People read so much into the scriptures that just simply aren't in the scriptures. Let me emphasize what the scriptures really say in contrast to what people think they say. I'm going to paraphrase seven well-known verses from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, in keeping with the popular teaching of our day. To hear the preachers expounding the things of God, it should read something like this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in hell, believe also in heaven. In heaven there are many mansions. You know I've told you this and have described its beautiful golden streets many, many times. I am going to heaven to prepare a mansion just over the hilltop for you. And if I go and prepare a mansion for you, I'll come again and take you away to heaven, that where I will be, you will be also. And you all know well that I'm going to heaven, and you know the way to heaven. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we didn't know you were going to heaven, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man shall ever get to heaven but by me. If ye have known me, you should have known my Father also. But when you get to heaven, you shall know him, and you shall see him. Now I'm paraphrasing John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, the way the Orthodox Church teaches it. As strange as it may seem, the subject of the 14th chapter of John is not heaven. In fact, Jesus rarely spoke of heaven in the traditional sense during his entire ministry. Jesus came not as a revelation of some geographical or astral location, but as the expression of a glorious person. And that person is the Father. It may come as a shock to you, but the word heaven nor any synonym thereof appears even once in this entire chapter of John chapter 14. But the term Father is used some 23 times. It should be obvious to any thinking mind that the thrust of Christ's word was to bring his disciples into a living relationship with the Almighty and Infinite Father. Jesus said in Matthew 11:27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now armed with the understanding that the key word in John chapter 14 is Father and not Heaven, 
Let us examine the profound truth here uttered by the lips of the Son of God, where he says, And I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Where does Jesus say he will receive us to in this passage? He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. To understand the deep meaning of this significant statement, we must see by the spirit of wisdom and revelation just where Christ is. The Lord has never anywhere promised to carry us off to a beautiful island somewhere, but in the tenderest tones he assures us that he is himself the way to the Father. He says in John 14:6, I am the way, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. The way to where? It's obvious that he is the way to the Father. The way is not a route through the Milky Way. The way is a person. And the destination is likewise a person. He said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It is in Christ that we are enabled to enter into an intimate relationship and vital union with the Father. Before either the first fruit company or the rest of the creation can be brought to the Father, it is vitally necessary that there be a gathering unto the Christ. This is the grand truth that the Holy Spirit is pointing to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28, where it says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. From the earliest times of antiquity, the Lord has spoken through the mouths of his prophets, foretelling of this gathering together unto Christ. The patriarch Jacob, at the time of his death, acting upon the direction of the Holy Spirit and with the spirit of prophecy upon him, called all his sons together to tell them what their posterity should become in the purposes of God. Putting his hand upon the head of his son Judah, he prophesied in Genesis 49.10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, which is Christ, come and to him shall the gathering of the people be. This is the same thing that Paul talks about in Second Thessalonians 2, 1, where he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming or presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. These two passages complement and explain each other. And they both clearly point to the repeated term, in Christ or in Him. Again and again, all through the Scripture, the Holy Spirit of God sets forth that privileged position of in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17-18, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled, which means to be harmonized or gathered together, us to himself by or in Jesus Christ. Then in Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 5 we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, and hath raised us up together, 
and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was in Christ. And it's in Christ that God reconciles and gathers together the world and all things unto himself. When a man or woman becomes a member of the Christ body, he or she commences to be rooted and grounded in him. It is from him we draw our life as roots draw their food and sustenance from the earth. And it is by the life of him that we are built up and grow to be a holy temple, which would be the many mansions, in the Lord and habitation of God through the Spirit, as stated in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And as stated in John 15, verse 4, where it's talking about the vine and the branches, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. This was Jesus' instruction, abide in me, and I in you. You know what abiding in him is. It is to consent with our whole soul to his being our life, to reckon upon him to inspire us in all that goes to make up life, and then to give up everything most absolutely for him to rule and work in us. It is the rest of the full assurance that he does each moment work in us what we are to be and so himself enables us to maintain that perfect surrender in which he is free to do all his will. If you long to walk with Christ, take courage at the thought of what he is and will prove himself to be if you trust him. He is the true vine. And no vine ever did so fully for its branches what he will do for us. Anyone that abides in him walks even as he walked. And that's not all. In 1 Peter 3.18, it reads, Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. This passage sets forth the great object of Christ's work that he might bring us to God. Christ came, died, and rose again to bring us to God. Listen to some of the phrases used in Hebrews chapter 7. Here it's talking about the better hope of the New Testament. It says, by which we draw nigh unto God. In that same chapter it says, he is able to save completely them that come to God by him. There's a great difference between the way to a house and the house itself. We don't want to remain in the way. We want to end in the object of our journey. Christ is the way, but what is the end of the way? The end is God the Father. Christ wants to bring us to God. A lot of times we find Christians so occupied with Christ they never get time for God. There's a great difference between going to Christ and going to God. In Christ, I have the gracious and merciful side of God's character. But that's not all of God's character we need to know. In Christ, we have the condescension of God coming near to us. But the object of that condescension is to bring us to that place where we can come unto Him to be one with the Father and like the Father in every way. You can never have all that God has provided unless you learn the lesson that Christ is going to win your heart that he may bring you back to God. Christ was not in himself self-sufficient when he was on earth. Every day he lived with a thought in him that there is one greater than I, and my blessedness is to live in dependence upon him with a will given up to his will and in a trust that counts upon his working. And if I am to be in Christ, and Christ in me, what was his life must become my life, fellowship with the Father and dependence upon the Father. Christ came to bring us to God. We need not only faith to realize that he is in us and that we are in him, but by faith we need to give ourselves up to his working. That as a living person, he can reveal the will of God perfectly in us 
and so breathe into us his own disposition and his own life. Christ is to dwell and live in us. We are not to count Christ as a separate being dwelling in our hearts as a locality, but Christ is to be in our hearts, in our lives, in our thinking, living, and willing as the very life of all we do so that he lives himself out through us. So Christ is formed in us and God sees the very figure, the very form of Christ in us. And as Christ is manifested within us in his disposition and spirit, the nearness of God becomes more intimate and the fellowship with God becomes more close. The bottom line is that God wants us to come nigh to him in Christ. Christ suffered that he might bring us to God. He endured all that he might bring us to God. Are you willing to take the time and trouble that you may be brought nigh to God? If that has become the object of our desires, we will understand the work of Christ far better. And our understanding and knowledge of that work will bring far more abundant fruit. Jesus came to reveal the Father and to bring us back to the Father by degrees. It's true that he came to save the world, but he came for much more than that. He came to reveal the Father to us. He is the way to the Father. By him we can return to the Father. He didn't fence everybody into a quote-unquote Jesus realm. Jesus knew the limitations of our human realm. He also knew the source of fullness when he said in John 14, 28, I go to my Father, for my Father is greater than I. You will understand a great truth when you understand that the Father is greater than all realms of sonship. Fatherhood is the position of being part of the life-giving force. There is a oneness with the Father, a relationship which he wants us to enjoy where we receive directly from him all that we need. Jesus spoke of that dimension in John 16, 23, when he said, In that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. This speaks of a deeper relationship with God. This is the evidence of our salvation being clearly revealed, the work of the Son being completed in our personal behalf. We shall have direct access to the Father. This will reveal that the Savior's working in us has been successful, that we are now prepared to enter into a deeper relationship with Him, able to approach the Father in His name. Or we could say, having received His name, we stand in the character and nature of all that his name implies. There are so many out there trying to find out where to go to find the answers they need. Revelation 5, 4 says, For no man has been found worthy to open and to read the book. It's evident to anyone that the more we progress towards spiritual maturity, the less anyone else has an answer for us. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 15, he that is spiritual judgeth, or discerneth, all things, yet he himself is judged, or discerned, of no man. Others who are just beginning their walk with Christ come to you or to some group and receive help. Prophecies are given, words of exhortation, edification, and comfort come forth, and they receive the answers they need. Yet you find for yourself there are none who can discern for you. In fact, far too often, they do not even understand your question, let alone get an answer for it. We look for a seer or a prophet or one who can draw out of the deep the water of life to satisfy, and there is no man able. Why? Because God purposes to bring us or to press us into a new relationship with himself until we learn to go directly to our Father and receive from him all that is needed for the occasion. When we appreciate our spiritual brethren, their love, their fellowship, their counsel, yet we are being brought to the place where we have to say, I'll go to the Father, for my Father is greater than all. We find ourselves being brought to the threshold of a new dimension, 
a deeper relationship than we have experienced before. While others are running from meeting to meeting and from preacher to preacher and from brother to brother, God places within our hearts that deep yearning to go to the Father. If God could give my brother a word of prophecy from me, why can't he speak it directly into my own heart? He can and he does when we learn to go to him and not just lean upon others for our group therapy. Ephesians 3:14 through 15 says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Rotherham translation renders this from whom every fatherhood in heaven and upon earth is named. And the Amplified Bible says, From whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that father from whom all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name. While much can be said for sonship and what it means to become a mature son of God, led by the Spirit and always doing the will of the Father, yet we find that there is a purpose for this fully qualified state of sonship, a purpose on which there has been very little teaching. The sons are still in their preparation. But the more the grace of God inworks his divine purpose for this coming into maturity and being received of God as a true son, the more also he begins to unveil that glory to which we are called and of which we shall be partakers. This includes the glory of fatherhood. All of the training and discipline of bringing a child to maturity to where God can invest in them the fullness of his spirit to where they will at all times be motivated and controlled by the Spirit, all of this is now leading into a deeper dimension where the crowning glory of sonship is manifested in fatherhood. If all the ways of natural life are normal, no young man is content to just stay at the age of recognized maturity, strong, qualified to be on his own, but soon there awakens within him that desire to be able to produce out of himself be it in the field of creative activity, birthing a business of his own, developing an established practice in his chosen profession, or raising a family and establishing and providing for his own home. But regardless of how his energy is expended, he desires to accomplish something, to make a name for himself, to raise up out of his own efforts that which testifies to his ability. In the realm of our spiritual application, we find this holds a tremendous word of truth. God is doing more than just bringing his chosen remnant to maturity so that they can stand in full strength. But he is also leading them on into fatherhood. And while it's true we are already projecting our vision beyond experience in these spiritual realms, yet God is placing a vision before his own a goal set before, and then he will bring them into the fulfillment thereof. Jesus, the man Jesus, knew his position as a son, but he also knew of his position as a father, and that it was expedient for him to return to that realm from which he would be able to impart, pour out of himself, that flow of the Spirit which we now need to bring us to maturity. He had condescended to men of low estate, manifested in the flesh, becoming an offering for our sins. But when the sacrifice was complete, he was ready to ascend far above all principality and powers, that he might again be the fullness of him that filleth all in all. As Ephesians 4 verses 10 through 11 state, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, and he gave. Yes, returning into his fatherhood position, he began to give, imparting out of himself, sending forth the Spirit into our hearts, whereby now we are able to cry, Abba, Father. He is our Father. It is from him we have received grace for grace. And when he has finished imparting of this superabundance of his grace to us, we shall have that same sufficiency which he possesses and be able to impart it to others. Again, the challenge is not to just become a son, but to go on and being filled with his fullness so that we can become life givers 
even as he became a life-giving spirit. It's from him that we derive our fatherhood. There is a fatherhood realm, a position in God where we'll be able to impart life. We still desire for his fullness. It touches our heart when we send someone in need and find that we do not have the substance to be able to meet that need. We have love and compassion in us, and of course we pray and encourage and share the burden, but we still cannot impart life. We take them to an altar and pray with them, but we can't save them. It is a sovereign act of God. We hold up their hands in praise, tell them to hang on or to let go, and highly confuse them as to how to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but we cannot and could not impart the spirit to them we are not yet fathers but God is going to bring his remnant to the place where he can receive them into himself and by reason of this union they will have something to impart it is self-evident that inasmuch as from our father God all fatherhood takes its title and derives its name in, and inasmuch as those who enter into this realm in God are filled with his fullness and are partakers of his divine nature, so that they might beget the same, then it follows that the attributes of our own Father are to be found in these fathers. We have the same conclusion as Paul stated. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming or the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, he speaks of something higher far than the childish notion of Jesus streaking across the heavens like a flaming meteorite while bodies arise from the cemeteries to be gathered together unto him in the upper atmosphere. It's not a physical or limited thing at all. It speaks of a realm of spiritual reality. It's not a gathering together of physical bodies into a certain place, but a gathering on a spiritual plane of experience unto the person of himself. Christ is gathering a people together in his parousia, in his presence, that he may bring them to God. God is not one place and Christ another place and we another place. It's not necessary that the Lord should return from some far off heaven to this earth in order to raise the dead. All that he has undertaken to do, he can do from anywhere. For he is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The power of the voice or the touch or the manifestation of the Son of God is not diminished by distance. The gathering together unto Christ has nothing whatever to do with either time or space. It is an event of spirit and truth and reality. And as the Apostle shows in the verses that follow the statement in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there's a day yet to come, the day of Christ, the day of many sons come to glory, the day of perfection and maturity, the day of fullness and triumph, the day of power and dominion, the day of creation's deliverance and restoration back into God. But the dawning of that day is rooted in a first fruit company that lives in his presence being gathered together unto him, and there in him, brought by and through him, unto the glory of the Father. This is fatherhood. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 4 says, Then shall come in the last day scoffers, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. The King James Version renders it, Where is the promise of his coming? But the Greek word for coming here is the Greek word parousia, which means presence. So the real translation should read, Where is the promise of the presence of himself? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Or phrased another way, it could be, Where is his promised presence? seeing that all things continue on as from the beginning of creation. What it's saying is, where is the fulfillment of the promise? The scoffers are implying that the promise has utterly failed, that Christ is not present, 
that there is not the slightest evidence that his coming has ever been accomplished, that they who believe in here and now are certainly deluded. The reason the scoffers are saying such things is partly because Christians are saying just the same thing. Unfortunately, many Christians are saying the Lord is coming at some future time, and they are not holding forth the truth of his presence. The fact that all things continue to go on as they have always done is proof to the carnal mind that the Lord is still away. The sun rises and sets, the tides ebb and flow, the seasons follow each other in the usual order. Men are born, live and die, one generation succeeds another, as has always been the case. Nations rise and fall, there are wars and rumors of war, sin abounds, and all external evidence points to the belief that these conditions will continue as they have always done. So the scoffers are asking the question, where is his promised coming? As Matthew 13:38 says, the world lieth in the lap of the wicked one, and is dead in trespasses and sin, according to Ephesians chapter 2. And the natural man understandeth not the spiritual things of God, neither can he, for they are spiritual spiritually discerned according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 through 14 scoffers belong to the world but how much more pitiful when we find that the great mass of Christians who are supposed to be the children of light and to have spiritual discernment are failing to receive him because they see him not but continue to gaze into the skies while Christians century after century have eagerly scanned the heavens for signs of the appearing of the Lord, they have forgotten to live in the glory of the presence of Christ here and now. It is possible for the saints here and now to live in the constant and continual presence of the Christ who walked the shores of Galilee, the Christ who healed the sick and raised the dead, the Christ at whose voice demons fled like darkness before piercing light, the Christ who spake as never man spake. The Christ who lived and died and rose again and ascended on high. The Christ who has been given all power in heaven and in earth. This mighty Christ walks with us still. He walks within us. Closer to us even than the air we breathe or the blood that courses its way unceasingly through our veins. Christ is no longer far away. He is here. The saints don't need to say any longer who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from above or who shall descend into the deep to bring Christ again from the dead. The word, or Christ, is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, according to Romans 10, 6 through 7. The moment the fact of Christ's presence grips your heart and fills your mind by the Holy Spirit, the reality of his abiding presence will begin to transform your life. And where is his promised presence? He told us in the words that cannot fail in 1 Peter 1, 8. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now abides with us forever whom, having not seen, we love, and whom, though now we see him not, or at least with physical eyes, yet believing, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.